Our theme verse here for the commands of Christ, again, uh, I told you before, several weeks ago, when I was in the Marine Corps, we had an extensive amount of training to, to train us to be uh, Marines, to serve our country. But to serve the living God and to be Christians in the world that we live, there was really no kind of progressive training. And when I came across this verse where it says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, I know that that's what we're supposed to do. But we're supposed to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And Jesus says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And again, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll, you'll keep my commands. So again, each night, each Wednesday night, we're just looking at one of the commands of Christ to understand what they are. Even, it's not so much of a topical study. I don't pick the topic as I went through the four Gospels and I just differentiated between what was a command and what was just uh, something that Jesus was saying. These are the commands that Christ taught his first disciples. And interesting, when you go through the book of Acts, you'll see that the, uh, the apostles repeat what they learned from Jesus. And then when you look through the epistles, you'll see that Paul and Peter and James, they actually clarify things that they didn't understand in references to the commands of Christ. And so what the, uh, the Jewish nations would do, they literally would tie these things so if you come back next week with some like double stick tape and you have it on your forehead, so as you shave in a mirror, you can see them, you can do that or put them on your hands. But more importantly, the, the word obey and the word observe, are, there's, there's a slightly different <clears throat> variation between those words because when we think of obey, we think of say the 10 commandments or the commands of Christ, we think of 100% perfection, obey them. But Jesus says, observe these commands, which is slightly different than the word obey. In a sense, when the wind-driven ships were out there and they would look at the stars, and I've done a lot of this in the military before we had our GPS systems, but even with GPS systems, you don't really obey the GPS system. You don't really obey the stars. You observe them. You watch them carefully. You, you, as your ship, there's certain devices on your ship that you can use that actually point you at a star. And as you are looking around and all of a sudden you look back, you're off a little bit. So as you're observing the star, you just turn back onto that star. And even navigation systems today, they'll, t they'll tell you literally to turn left five degrees or turn right five degrees. And so by observing the stars, you stay on track. And I believe what Jesus is telling us with these commands of Christ, these 49 commands of Christ, as you walk your Christian life from now until the rapture or until you meet the Lord face to face, that these commands are really that you need to observe them. They, are, they will keep you on the path that Christ has you for. And as we'll get into that one command, the, uh, the narrow road. And so when we do something wrong and we look back at the command, like uh, some of our commands we have already, follow me, rejoice, let your light shine, honor God's law. If you're not rejoicing and all of a sudden you realize you're not rejoicing, you look back at the command and then you, you go back and do what the Lord has commanded us to do. And so again, these wind-driven ships... If it wasn't for the stars, if it wasn't for some type of navigation system, they would just literally go in circles. And a lot of times us as Christians will we'll get a hold of a Bible and we don't know where to start. We don't know what to, what to read and there's thousands of different scriptures and sometimes it's hard to determine exactly what we're supposed to do as believers. But again, these commands of Christ, as I've learned them and relearned them and relearned them, and I've been a Christian for more than 35 years, and these commands of Christ have changed my life more than anything that I've ever read any school that I've ever gone to. Because I really looked at what Jesus was telling his first disciples and what he wants us to do. And tonight's command is no different. Tonight's command is to be perfect. And this is one of the hardest commands that, to comprehend. As a matter of fact, many of the commentaries just avoid this when they come to this part of the scriptures. They'll just say it and then move on to the next thing. But for us, we can't just avoid it because it's, it's actually a command. And so understanding this command and the corresponding character quality of sincerity is what we're going to try to do tonight. And you're going to help me do it. You'll see when we get to a certain part. And so, so far in the Sermon of the Mount, we see, uh, just to back up a second, 18 of Jesus' 49 commands are in the Sermon of the Mount. Nine of those commands are in Matthew 5 alone. And tonight we're going to do the last command that's in Matthew 5. Now you know that the Bible was never written in chapter and verse, but it was broken up into the Sermon of the Mount. And then the Sermon of the Mount has different sections, and this command tonight really is a summation of the first eight commands that Christ gave us in the Sermon of the Mount. It really is who the inner person is, who we are really as people. And this last command really is 
Jesus summarizes all that we should be. And so, in this Matthew 5, we first see that Jesus talks about the Beatitudes, or the attitudes that we should have. And I have a little video for you, so I don't have to go through each of those Beatitudes for you. The video does a, a better job, where Jesus tells us, these are the attitudes you should have, you should be the salt and the light. And so we'll run that video clip, and after that I'll come back to Matthew chapter 5. And he began to teach them, saying, Blessed but poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown great mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. They will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, lie about you, and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Be excited, because great is your reward in heaven. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You cannot be hidden. People don't light a lamp and put it under a cover. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men. Interesting how the, uh, the sound in the video was off a little bit. It's actually, uh, it's up to par for the, the things that I've been experiencing this week, studying this command. Just about every way I've turned, there's always been things that are not working right. So I really believe that in this command, the application of this command, just somebody in here, this is going to change your life. Because uh, I seem to be attacked more this week than I have in the previous commands. Anyway, also in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus told us that uh, murder, we know that that's wrong, but anger, that leads to name-calling, that's, that's a sin. That adultery, of course, is wrong, but even lusting a woman with your eyes is also a sin. Lying in any form is a sin. Seeking revenge against people is a sin. The eye for eye law, it was a good law, but it was designed for courts so that the, their punishment would not exceed what the crime was. But God has never allowed us to take personal vengeance at any time. And then we were taught last week uh, that we should love your neighbor, but that was never in the Bible. You should love your neighbor as yourself, and there's a huge difference, and also to love your enemy. So if we look at the Beatitudes, we look at anger, lust, lying, revenge, love your enemy, love your neighbor as yourself. If you would gauge yourself or give yourself a report card, how, how would we be doing in keeping these? Would we be maybe 70, 85 percent? Or maybe after learning these, maybe we're, we're getting a little bit better? Well, in Jesus' last command is... In, the, in this part of the Sermon of the Mount, his standard is to be perfect, 100%. He says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter into the kingdom of God. And see, the scribes and the Pharisees, they're, they had self-righteousness. They tried to appease God in their own strength. They tried to keep God's laws and his statutes and be better in their own strength. And they had the attitude, I will try harder. And see, we still have that attitude. We, we do the same thing. For some reason, we always seem to think that we can just earn our way into heaven. Or what God has given us as a free gift, there's some way that we can earn that. But tonight we're going to learn that we can't earn it. And there is a way to be perfect. And so before we get started, let's pray. Father, I do thank you for this command, Lord, and it was one of the hardest to learn, to one of the hardest to understand. And Lord, even though I understand it now, I just sometimes cannot even internalize completely how amazing it is. And so, Lord, I just pray that by your Spirit, you can help each and every one of us, Lord, to truly understand what this command means to us, what you meant when you were telling your disciples, and, and all that heard us, and even now as we'll hear it, what it truly means, Lord and how to obey it. And so, Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight's command is to be perfect, and here's the standard, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And it comes, like I said, is the last 
a verse actually in Matthew 5 in the Sermon of the Mountain, so I'll read it. Part of it is from last week. Uh, I'm reading partially last week because Jesus says, be perfect, therefore, so we go back a little bit to see what it's there for. He says, you heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. Because he causes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And if you love those who love you, well, what reward will you have? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? So be perfect, therefore, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were convinced that they were better than everybody else. They taught everybody that they were better than everybody else, and people even believed that they were better than everybody else. But Jesus tells them that their self-centered love is really no different than the tax collectors and even the Gentiles. And so everyone who heard it at the time, were, we were shocked, especially the scribes and the Pharisees. What is this teaching that Jesus is telling them? Because many believed that the kingdom of heaven consists of God, the scribes and the Pharisees, the Jews, and that's it. That's what the kingdom of heaven consisted of, which is why Nicodemus was shocked when Jesus told him, for God so loved the world, not just the Jews, the world, all people in the world. They were not used to hearing that. And so picking up where we left off last week, I want to show you five things that lead up to this command where Jesus is telling us to be perfect. And then we'll get into an application of, of what it means to be perfect or how we can be perfect. And so we're going to talk about love your enemies, bless, do good, and pray for those, your enemies. Uh, be like your father. Go above and beyond and be perfect. And the first thing is love your enemies. We learn much about ourselves when we're attacked by other people, when people insult us, make fun of us, or for some reason bother us. When I teach the kids, I use a milk analogy, and I might have told you before, if you shake a glass of water, what comes out of the glass? Water. And if you shake a glass of milk, what comes out of the glass? Milk. You see, what comes out is what's inside. And so when somebody pushes you or irritates you or annoys you, and something vile comes out of your mouth, they didn't make you do that. That's what was inside of you, and that's what naturally comes out. And so last week we looked at how some godly people actually reacted when people did this to them or reacted to their enemies. We looked at Elijah. Elijah had the wisdom to actually feed his enemy and send him home. And as a result, the Syrians never attacked Israel again at that time. We looked at King David, how King David had the opportunity to kill Saul. But he refused to kill his enemy. We also looked at this man, uh, George Wishart. And as he was being executed for being a pastor, for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, he told his executioner, he actually kissed him on his cheek, and he told him that he forgave him for what he was going to do. Today I want to show you a few more examples so we can understand really how we're supposed to love our enemies, how God expects us to love our enemies, and what the results are, are when we love our enemies. You may not know who this man is, uh, Erwin Stanton, but Erwin Stanton, he did not like Abraham Lincoln at all. As a matter of fact, some of the quotes that he has that are written in the history books, he called Lincoln a low, cunning clown, and he nicknamed him the original gorilla. He said things like, men are foolish to wander to Africa to try to capture a gorilla when they can find one right here in Springfield, Illinois. And he constantly would bash Abraham Lincoln. But when the war broke out, President Lincoln appointed Stanton as the Secretary of War. He was actually the man that was over all the soldiers of the United States of America at the time. And he treated Stanton with love and respect and honor. And after the war and the night that Lincoln died, this is what Stanton said through tears. He said, there lies the greatest ruler of men the world have ever seen. And so Abraham Lincoln certainly knew how to treat his enemies and then also changed his enemies. Here's Abraham Lincoln with Irwin. Again, as Secretary of War, which we would call Secretary of Defense today. In Acts 7, you're probably familiar with the story of Stephen, or Stephen. As the Stephen addressed the Sanhedrin, Stephen, I'll call him, he was a deacon at the time. He wasn't actually a pastor, but he was a man of God. He would tell everybody about Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done for us on the cross and how there was eternal life. 
And so the Sanhedrin brought him to their council, which is their supreme court, to decide on what they should do with him. And as he was standing before the supreme court, Stephen very eloquently, so they didn't think that he was totally crazy in what he was saying, he accurately gave them the history of the Jewish nation up through the time of Moses. And then all of a sudden, this is what he said, and I'm going to quote. He said, but you stubborn people, you were heathens at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Not one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the one who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah, whom you betrayed and you murdered. You deliberately disobey God's law, even though you received God's law through the hands of angels. Of course, they weren't very happy when they heard that. When they heard that, the Bible says that they were cut through their heart. Not only they were angry, but the important part is they knew it was true, and they were cut to the heart. And so Stephen looked up at that time. An amazing thing happened. He looked up, and he actually saw heaven opened, he says. He says, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. And now you know the Bible tells us that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. But at this point, God knew that Stephen was going to be killed. And Jesus actually stood up to welcome him into the kingdom. And so, they literally screamed at him, the text tells us. They screamed at him, they covered their ears, they could not hear it, and they brought him out to be stoned. Now, the Jewish method of stoning, you may or may not know, is that they normally would bring him off to some type of a, a cliff, a drop-off, about a 10-foot drop-off. And the person who was the first accuser, he would actually grab the biggest stone that he could lift, and he was trying to crush his head. And then the person who was the second accuser, remember, you cannot receive death unless you have two witnesses. So the first person had to throw the first stone, the second person the second stone. And as they were stoning Stephen, he actually said, Lord, receive my spirit. He was crying out. He didn't say it once. He said it several times, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he did an amazing thing. Even though he was being stoned, most people would fall down and cover their head and cover their body. He actually came to a kneeling position. And he said with a loud voice, he said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And so Saul, who later becomes the Apostle Paul, was actually there at the stoning of Stephen and actually approved of his death. And so Stephen must have learned this from Jesus. I don't know if Stephen actually saw Jesus or was a little bit after uh, the time Jesus uh, ascended. But he must have heard the story when Jesus was on the cross in Luke 23, where Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And that is very important for us to remember when it comes to our enemies, no matter whether they're enemies at war or enemies when our government, enemies and our friends. Most of the time, people do not know what they're doing. Most people do not realize that when they die without Christ, they will be in a lake of fire for all eternity. Martin Luther said it best. He says, if we can just dip people into the lake of fire for a second, they would change their minds. But today, you saw that the laws are changing in regard to marriage. You see that the world is getting worse and worse, and people are becoming more and more arrogant, just as they were in the time of Noah. But people don't realize that one day they will wind up in the lake of fire. But you and I know for a fact that they will wind up in the lake of fire. And so we have to be careful not to hate these people, not to alienate these people, but to pray for these people and try to get an opportunity to reach these people. See, Jesus willingly took the insults of all the people. He suffered and he died because it says in Timothy, he says he wants all men to be saved, all men, and come to a knowledge of the truth. And so today, in the age that we live in, we think of love your enemy. Are you kidding? Seriously, you want me to love my enemy? How about the Democrats loving the Republicans? Is that ever going to happen? getting together, working on something, doing what they're paid to do. You think that's going to happen? Probably not. How about duck fans loving king fans? You think that's going to happen? My wife happens to be a, a king's fan, and a lot of our friends are duck fans. And they're Christians. They do love each other. How about old people loving young people? There's people in Polynesian culture today, they hang special articles inside their hut. And if you would ask them, what are these different articles for? This is what they're for. They're the reminders of people that have injured them. Reminders of people that have insulted them. They specifically hang them around their house. And they only remove those articles when they seek revenge and they get revenge. And so we live in a very hateful society. This is the human way, but it's not God's way. 
God tells us to love your neighbor as yourself. And so our object to love really is uh, object-oriented. For example, we, we look at good-looking girls or good-looking guys, a good-looking car, house, clothes. These are the things that attract us. But see, agape love actually seeks the highest good of others. It seeks to meet the needs of others. In John 17, as we'll see here in Jesus, what he did, after washing his disciples' feet, this is what he told them, and this is what he tells us, love one another as I have loved you. This was the job of a servant. Now, Jesus didn't love his disciples because they were just nice guys. Most of them were not nice guys. A lot of them were fishermen, and they probably stunk. They smelled. They didn't have all the foo-foo stuff we have today. They argued a lot. A lot of them argued over who would be the greatest in the kingdom, who could sit at Jesus' right hand, who could sit at his left hand. They were hard-headed learners. Jesus often had to repeat what he told them over and over and over again were no different. But interesting, most of them were not even at the cross when Jesus died. They were not even there to comfort him when he died. So Jesus certainly didn't love these men because they were just great people. They were just nice people to love. He loved them because he loved them. Now in 1 Corinthians 13, we read this and we may know this. There's actually 15 characteristics of love that are listed in 1 Corinthians 13. But every one of the characteristics in the Greek language is a verb. And we know that a verb is an action word. So every one of these words in 1 Corinthians is an action word. And so let me read some of them to you and kind of give you a brief understanding of what they are if you don't know already. The first one is love is patient. Patient with people. That's what it means. It's not just patient. It's patient with people. It's kind, which means it does good things to others. It helps those that are in need. It says love does not envy. In other words, it's happy when other people are successful, when other people get promoted. It does not boast. It does not brag about itself or buff, puff itself up above others. It considers other people better than themselves. It's not arrogant or rude, which means it doesn't have a big head. It's not rude, rude mean considerate of other people. It has manners. It's courteous to other people. It does not insist on its own way. In other words, it's concerned with other people. It's not unselfish. It's not irritable. In other words, it can control its anger. It's graceful under pressure. It's not resentful. It never seeks revenge, and it doesn't do evil to others. It does not even think of evil of others. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, and it keeps no wrong. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs, either written or in your head, and we are prone to do that. It doesn't enjoy when other people get punished when they do wrong. It rejoices in the truth, which means it's encouraging, it's positive. It bears all things, and the word bear means to cover something. It defends others. It's a defender of others, even though they do things that are silly. It defends them. It believes all things. It's not suspicious. It believes the, the best in people. It hopes for all things. It expects the best in people. It's optimistic that there can be change. There can be positive changes in people's lives. And it endorses all things. It never gives up. It's no matter what. It, it always says that I love you. Because love never fails, the Bible tells us. It never ends and it never fails. I like this little prism here because it reminds me of the effects of love. When you love someone, it just kind of splits out in all these different colors, all these different patience, love, kindness. But do we love like this? Do we love our enemies like this? The people that don't like us, do we act like this towards them? I'm not saying that we should love criminals for the things that they do. We certainly shouldn't. We're not supposed to love liars and gossipers for the things they do. We don't even love the people that make our life miserable because of the things they do. We love these people because the things that they do prove that they need a savior. The way that they act prove that they don't know the Lord. This is what Paul tells us. In Romans 12, 17, he says, do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And do not take revenge, my friend, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. So on the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And do not over, be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And so oftentimes I would see that when you do this, you're going to heap burning coals on her head. 
And people are thinking, oh, yeah, that's good. It's like, I'm not going to seek revenge. I'll just bless them. And, and in blessing them, God will heap burning coals on their head. But it doesn't mean what we think it means. He, heaping burning coals on someone's head means that it would bring a burning conviction into their heart that what they're doing is wrong, that what they're doing is hateful, and that what they're doing is sin. Because when they insult you and you don't insult them back, it says God will put the conviction on their heart that what they did was wrong. You don't have to do that. So it doesn't mean that God puts a zammy on them or something. And so the second point is, bless, do good, and pray for your enemies. Now we looked at that briefly last week. I just want to touch on it again. There's three ways to do this. The first way is to bless those who curse you, Jesus tells us. Now all of us have been cursed. Every one of us when we were growing up, or even now, even today maybe, people might have told you things like, you're ugly, you're no good, you're going to amount to nothing. And the Bible teaches that these are, these are cuss words, not in the word that we would think today. But when we do this to our children, when we tell our children you're useless, you're worthless, you're amount to nothing, we are actually putting a curse on that child. That child will internalize what you are telling them, and most of the time will actually become the things that you tell them. And so the way that you reverse these curses that people curse you is the Bible tells us to bless those who curse you. And when you bless those who curse you, it actually releases you of that curse. And so what is a blessing? A blessing is a eulogy. A blessing is saying something nice about somebody. Like, for example, my father was an alcoholic, and he died as an alcoholic. And I can always think of the horrible things that he's done to me when I was a child. But I always remember the positive things, that he, that he gave us wine for dinner, for example. I always enjoyed that when I was a little kid. And the fact that when I was even older, after I got out of the orphanage and as I was living in the car and my dad got out of jail, he always had a place for me to come. Now, it was, a, it was no food, and there was no nothing there, but there's always positive things that I can think of someone, no matter how wicked they are. And so that's what the Lord tells us to do. Bless those who curse you. And there's people that curse us all the time. People will do all kinds of things that will cause you to be, feel insulted, feel like they're against you. And instead of thinking bad thoughts about them, bless them. Think of only the positive things that you can. And do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who hate you, that God will give you an opportunity to speak to them. I constantly pray for my neighbor because for some reason, I don't know why, even to today, he just does not like me. He doesn't like any of the other neighbors either, so I guess that's good. But I always pray, God, give me an opportunity that, to help him somehow, that there's some need that he has uh, so I can show him that I don't hate him in return. And pray for those who despitefully use us and they persecute us. Why? Because, again, we have to realize God's word is truth. And Isaiah tells us that there is no peace to the wicked, saith the Lord. And those people that do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, no matter what facade they put on, how, no matter how good they may appear to you in their hearts, there is no peace with God. They have no relationship with the living God. They have a fear of death. They have a conscience. They're with knowledge. They know that they have sinned and violated the living God. The Bible says that God has put eternity in their heart. They know that when they die, there is more beyond, no matter what they say. They might have a good facade, but the, the Lord tells us that there's no peace to these folks. And so we need to pray for them. And see, Christians also, you'll find out that Christians are the most hated people in the world. And Christians, you and I are going to be hated even more and more in this world as we go into these end times that we live in. Why? Because most people try to suppress their conscience. And the way they suppress their conscience and hide their guilt and hide their fear of death is with busyness and all the different things that they do. They try to even deny that God even exists. They try to deny that one day that they're going to die and God's going to punish them. And then when you and I come along as a Christian and we use God's word and we remind them that they are sinners, that they have lied, cheated, and stole and broke God's commands and that God is real, you actually uncover all the things that they're trying to hide. You basically reawaken their conscience. And when you do that, they don't like that. And they're going to attack you any way that they can to stop you from doing that. They'll take the Ten Commandments out of school. They'll, my wife just told me uh, something today. I can't remember what it is, a law that was passed uh, that you can't teach creation in school at all. 
You can teach everything else, but in public schools, you cannot teach creation. Not even as a theory, you just cannot teach it. And so what people are trying to do is trying to suppress their conscience. They're trying to hide in, through drugs, religion, and all kinds of things that there is no God. And so when you and I come along and tell them, oh, there is a God, there's a living God, and you've sinned against the God, and one day you're going to be in hell, they don't want to hear that. And so they're going to hate us more and more. Here's the man you might have heard of. I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name. His first name is Kepha, I would say. Now, there's a book out on here if you're interested in reading this. This amazing book is called A Distant Grief. This man was in Uganda when Idi Amin had his uh, regime there. And he hated Christians, as you know. And he sent men to this man's house because this man was making an impact on his community. And he sent men to his house to kill him. And when the men were at this guy's house with the guns to his head, ready to shoot him in the head, he prayed for them, that God would forgive him, and he told them about Jesus Christ. And every one of those men that were ready to kill him, when they heard the words coming out of his mouth, when they saw his love, when they realized that he had something they didn't have, every one of those men became a Christian right there on the spot. And so this amazing book, and these are stories that we're going to see more and more and more as we get into these end times. That those who hate Christians, that those who try to kill Christians, that those who put Christians in jail one day, the Bible will say, the very things that we say, if, if we let become salt, if we are the salt, we are the light, some people will come to know the Lord. I like what Greg Laurie said one time, I'll never forget it. He goes, if you throw a rock into a pack of dogs or even to a pack of people, how do you know who's been hit? The one who yells the most. And so oftentimes, when we say things that are in a work environment or, or anywhere, and people just become irate, because we're talking about God, we're talking about Jesus, those are the people who the Holy Spirit is speaking to their heart. Because if they weren't interested in it at all, they would just gaff it off. But because we say that God loves you, you're a sinner, have you ever sinned against God? When they hear that, instead of just gaffing it off, they'll start insulting you. They'll start trying to suppress that. So as you know, we say we need to hate sin, love the sinner, and ultimately pray for their salvation. The third point I want to tell you is that we need to be like your father. You need to be like your father. The Bible tells us that you need to be sons of your father in heaven. Now you may find this interesting or weird, what I'm going to tell you. I don't steal because stealing is wrong. And I don't lie because lying is wrong. And I don't lust because lusting is wrong. I don't put others down because that's wrong also. And I don't covet because coveting is wrong. As a matter of fact, if you try to tell children this is wrong, that is wrong, children know that stealing gets you free stuff. And the first time you tell them stealing is wrong and they go and they steal something, they get free stuff, they don't really understand why stealing is wrong because I just got free stuff and free stuff is good. Lying will get you out of trouble. Kids learn that pretty easily. Last thing, people call it eye candy. If you put somebody down and you're successful at it, you start to feel powerful. And everybody wants more stuff, so we always covet. But the reason I don't deliberately steal or lie or lust or put others down or covet is simply because I know who my father is. And because I know who my father is, I don't want to d disappoint my father who lives in heaven. And so that's the reason I don't do those things. Not just because it says, don't do those things. If I do those things, I disappoint my Father in heaven, and I don't want to do that. So we need to teach our children that also, not only not to do something wrong, but why they should not do it wrong. And so we're supposed to be like father, like son, and that's what Jesus was saying. That they will know that you are sons like your father. If you pray for people, if you don't insult people when they insult you back, people will look at you and say, he's just like Christ. He's just like God, even though they don't know God. When they see you, they see who God is by the way that you react. Jesus says that he, because God makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now, you may not catch that in there, and I didn't either until I looked at it closer. But there's a positive and negative, and then Christ switches the words. For example, he says he makes his sun rise on the negative, the evil, and then on the good, the positive. And then he switches it in the second part. He says, and then he sends rain on the positive, the just, and the unjust. And what Jesus is saying is there's no difference between the just, the unjust, the good, and the evil. God loves all people. God does not differentiate who he loves. He loves everybody. When the sun comes up, it shines for everybody. When the rain falls, it's for everybody. And so 
There's many days in the Marine Corps that I remember standing up at night, being in other countries, freezing, shaking, my stomach hurting, and I would pray and wait for that sun to come up in the morning. I remember being soaked to the bone, even now thinking of it, wet all the way through as wet as you can be, and freezing and shaking and just waiting two o'clock, three o'clock, because I knew, and I, I don't know if I should say this, but we called it the great heat tab in the sky, because heat tabs were little heat things that we used to use to heat our food and we could warm our hands. But when the sun would come up, you could slowly even see the steam come on your body, would slowly heat you up and warm you up. And many times I waited for the sun to come up. There's this one time when I was in Bridgeport, this was just in training. And this is what it looked like. And at nighttime, it got below zero. It gets really cold up there, especially at the top of the mountains when the wind blows and the wind chill factor. It gets below zero and it's really cold. And so what we did is we built these things called snow caves. I don't know if you can see it in there, but there's a little arrow there, a little hole in the snow. Instead of being out there in the middle of there at night, just my little body, 98.6 degrees, and having this minus 20 degree chill factor blowing down on me, especially after uh, skiing all day and sweating, it makes it even worse. And this is kind of what a snow cave looks like. You kind of dig a little hole, and it's an amazing thing. Uh, you could actually be down there, and I don't know if I can say this in church, but I was in my skivvy drawers, or my, like we call them our skivvy drawers, our t-shirts and your, and your underwear and you're actually warm in there. So I stacked all my stuff up and just ready to get into my sleeping bag. I was tired, just ready to zip it up. I just put my rifle to my side. Here's another picture of what it looks like. And I got about halfway zipped up and the whole thing collapsed on me. <laughs> it just completely fell on top of me. And I, I was buried in the thing. I couldn't get up, I couldn't move. I struggled to get out. It took me 20, 30 minutes to dig myself out of this thing in my skivvy drawers. And so now I finally make it to the top and I pop out and it's dark out, but the sky is crystal clear, I'll never forget it. Beautiful sky. You can see this, uh, the, the, the snow blowing up over the mountains and it was freezing out there. And I'm standing out there in the middle of nowhere in my underwear. And so I managed to reach my sleeping bag. I grabbed my sleeping bag, dug it. I just pulled it out through everything. I should have got my rifle on, but no under my sleeping bag, forget my rifle. And I got as much snow out as the sleeping bag I could and I got in that thing, I zipped it up and I just literally shaked until morning time, until the sun came up. And as the sun came up, I just, I can remember the warmth of the sun coming over the mountain. And I'll never forget that because the sun not only warmed me, but it even warmed all those other sinners that were out there that didn't even know Christ. So the sun comes up and it's not only for us as Christians, but it's for non-believers. And when it rains on Christian farms, it also rains on non-Christian farms. Also, when I was in Desert Storm, Desert Storm 1, whatever they call it, this is a B-52 bomber. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It looks, doesn't look as huge as it is there, but these things are used. They call them B-52s because they carry about 52,000 pounds of bombs. And this is just an array of bombs. And I'll never forget, night after night, day after day, from the position I was in as a reconnaissance marine, I was in a position where I could see a lot of what was going on up in the Iraqis' uh, positions, watching these planes come. And as I was watching these huge planes through the sky, and they would drop this little object, and another one, and another one, and another one, and 30 seconds would go by, and they're still dropping. A minute, two minutes, and they're still dropping, 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 dropping. And then as they hit the ground, the same thing, ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. This is one after the other after the other. And as I look up, there's a second one starting his payload, and there's a third one. And they just keep coming, and all different types of aircraft, they, they were in this thing called a stack. They just come in, they drop their ordnance, they go back to where they refuel and rearm, and they come back in a stack, and just nonstop for day after day after day. And I'm telling you, I took no pleasure at all in knowing what those bombs were doing to the Iraqi people, although they were considered our enemies. I had no pleasure whatsoever in thinking what was happening. The same token, when the war was over, and we found out they, they got Saddam Hussein, that was uh, a great day when they found him, but the day that they hung him, but brought no pleasure to me at all either. The day that I know that this man, this horrible man, the things that he did to his people uh, by chemically uh, using nerve agent on him, which is a horrible, horrible death, 
for men, women, and children, even after knowing that, it brought me no joy in knowing that this man has died. And so we show that we're children of God because we not only love those who love us, but we love our enemies and we pray for our enemies. That's what distinguishes us as believers and the living God. In Psalms, they say it the best, and I'm going to emphasize the word all here. In Psalms 145, it says this. It says, it says, the eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time, and you open your hand, and you satisfy the desires of every living thing. And the Lord is righteous in all his ways, and he, he is loving towards all he has made. And the Lord is near to all who call upon him, and to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of all who fear him. He hears the cries of all who cry to him, and he saves them. And the Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked will be destroyed. You see, God loves all people, but he also will destroy the wicked. These are the people that reject Christ. And so the fourth thing I want to tell you is that we need to do is we need to go the second mile, or we need to go above and beyond what others do. Because Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do that? Now, can you imagine what the scribes and the Pharisees were thinking when he related them to the tax collectors and telling them they're really no different than the tax collectors? See, the tax collectors, they were the most hated Jews because they were considered traitors. They actually worked for the Roman government and they collected taxes against the Jewish people. And not only did they collect taxes, but probably like they do today, they collect more than what they really need to build their own wealth. So Jesus was saying, you Pharisees, you love your own group of Pharisees. Well, the tax collectors, they love their own group of tax collectors also. So your love is really the same as theirs. And so Jesus first compared their love to the tax collectors, which were considered the lowest Jew. And then secondly, he compares them to the unthinkable group of people, the Gentiles. He says, even if you greet your brothers, what are you doing more than others? It's like a rhyme there, isn't it? If you greet your brothers, what are you doing more than others? It says, do not even the Gentiles, don't even the pagans do that. And so when they would greet, you see a lot of times on television how the people of that culture greet each other, they hug each other, and then they like kiss each other on both sides of the cheek. Kind of like that. Oh, sorry. All right, a little children's ministry stuff getting in there. <laughs> but he says, you, you Pharisees, you greet your own Pharisees with your little kisses on your cheeks and your little warm little hugs. But you know what? The Gentiles do the same thing. They hug each other. They greet each other with a kiss. So your love really is the same as theirs. And there's a little statement in the middle of both of those verses that says, what are you doing more than others? In other words, what makes you so different, Pharisees, than other people? And this is what Paul said, and Paul was a Pharisee at the time, not at the time he wrote this, but he was a Pharisee. What makes you different, Pharisees? Paul says this, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Because we're Jews, because we're Pharisees, not at all. We have already made the charge that there's no difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. We are all under sin. For it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks after God. All have turned away, and they have together become worthless. And there is no one who does good, not even one. And so in Matthew 5, Jesus teaches us the Beatitudes. He clarifies that anger, lust, lying, revenge, and hate, they're all sinful. And he shows us that no one's perfect. He shows us that we have all sinned, and we all love just like every other person loves. So perhaps Jesus' next command, I would think, is something like, from now on, you need to try harder. Or simply, Jesus' command, his 11th command is, try harder. Do better than what you've been doing, but it doesn't. A common expression that we say today is, well, no one's perfect. It's like, come on, give me a break. No one's perfect. But this is Jesus' next command after he tells us all these things about the Beatitudes, about how we should be, about anger, lust, lying, uh, how we should treat one another, how we should greet one another. He says this, Jesus says, be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. So let's look at perfect. As I said, when I started, there's many commentaries that I've that I read, some that I trust, and an old friend of mine told me a, a commentary, and this is probably like an inside joke. A common commentary is no different, they're like a commentator, commentator like you and I. So they're, they're, no, they're not special people, they're just people that write books about what the Bible says. But as I looked into several of these commentations, people come to this verse 
where it says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect, and then they just go on to the chapter 6. And it's like, that's not going to help me. Because, uh, first of all, Jesus says, be perfect, therefore. And so when I look back in therefore, first thing it tells me, uh, that's what that slide was for. It says, this is what Jesus said in Matthew 5. He said, uh, bless those who curse you. He says, do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Love everyone and greet everyone. And so what would be the opposite of that? We would say, well, don't, don't bless those who curse you and don't do good to those who hate you and don't pray for those who use you and don't love everyone and don't greet everyone. And so most of the commentaries had these two separate positions on what this means. The first position that people would say is this word perfect and it and all centers around the word perfect because Jesus says, be perfect. And some people say the word perfect means this. It means perfection. It means you can make no mistakes. You have to be absolutely sinless. And Jesus is telling us, you need to be like that. And it's like, uh oh, there's a problem there because that is correct. Because the standard that Jesus gives right there, he says, you need to be perfect just as your heavenly father is perfect. And we know our heavenly father is perfect. So that is a true definition. And the second position that people would say is, no, the word doesn't mean perfection as we think of perfection. The word itself actually means maturity. You, you need to come to full maturity or you need to be wholly devoted to God, wholly devoted to God. And so I've had a problem in, in trying to figure out which one these are is because the command itself says be perfect. And in order to obey this command, I really need to understand what it means. And so a while back when I first came to California, someone gave me a sandwich and it had mayonnaise on it. And I asked them, what kind of mayonnaise was this? And they told me it was best foods. And I said, well, it's nasty. I said, you need to put Hellman's mayonnaise on there because Hellman's mayonnaise is the best mayonnaise that there is. And they never heard of Hellman's mayonnaise because I'm from New Jersey. I said, no, New Jersey, and we have this awesome mayonnaise is Hellman's. This best food California stuff is, no, it's for the groupies. It's nasty. And so they said, no, I've been to, I've been to East Coast. I had Hellman's. Hellman's is nasty. And so I picked up the jar, the best food jar, because I wanted to see what kind of California phony ingredients they had on here. And interesting what I read, it said this. It says, Hellman's, or it says best food, is known as Hellman's east of the Rockies. It's the exact same mayonnaise. And so, how are they allowed to do that? And so, in looking at this word perfect, can, can both of the commentaries be correct? Can it mean perfection, sinless, without sin, and also maturity at the same time? We're actually going to do a little word study on that. But first, to help you understand it, I want to go to Matthew 19. And in Matthew 19, you might have heard this verse many times. It says this, it says, And Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And see, the culture at the time taught the people that rich people could get into heaven a lot easier than poor people. It made sense to them because rich people had more money, which meant that they could do more good works. They could buy more stuff for the poor, more stuff for the needy. They could even put more in the offering plate. So naturally, God loves the rich people more because the rich people do more. But Jesus corrected their understanding by saying this. He goes, no, I tell you the truth, it's hard for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, how hard is it? He goes, well, again, I tell you, it's easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And see, what Jesus was saying is a camel cannot enter through the eye of a needle, and a rich person cannot buy his way into heaven. That's what Jesus was telling us. And so when the disciples heard this, and I don't know where my camel picture is, but it's okay. When the disciples heard this, they were astonished. And they asked each other, they said, well, then who can be saved? So Jesus looked at him and said, he goes, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You cannot buy your way into heaven. Who can be saved? If the rich can't be saved, then who can be saved, the disciples were thinking. And Jesus' answer is shocking. He says, nobody can be saved. Nobody. Neither the rich, neither the poor, 
or nobody in between. To be saved is absolutely impossible for man to do. You see, God's standard is perfection. And so you need to be perfect to go to heaven. And no man is perfect, so it's absolutely impossible for man to save himself. But he says, with God, all things are possible. So if perfection and sinlessness and is God's standards, and does, how does God make us perfect? How does this happen? So I want you to look at the different words I looked at. This is kind of like a, a condensed word study on the word perfect itself so that we can get into the application of, of what it means to be perfect. These are just uh, seven different words from the G means Greek and H means from the Hebrew Bible and their languages, and, and I'll try to pronounce them, teleos, tamen, tam, and uh, salam. And the first one says, the first word says you need to be complete, finished, and mature. That's the definition. Another word that we find in the Bible says complete, whole, and unblemished. Another word says complete, whole, and undefiled. Another one says complete, whole, and finished. So there's a lot of similarities, but the one that's common through every definition of the word perfect in the Bible is the word complete. And the one that has at least two of the words is the word whole. So just looking at a word study of the word perfect, to be perfect means to be complete, it means to be whole, it means to be finished, it means to be unblemished, and it means undefiled. And so who are some of these people in the Bible that God says are perfect? I'll give you four real quick, and then we'll look at the application. In Genesis 6, 9, it says, Noah was a just man. This is the Lord saying this, and he's perfect in his generation. He walked with God all the days of his life. In Job 1, 1, it says, There was a man in the land of Uz, not Oz, Uz. His name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, one who feared God and avoided evil. In Psalms 101, 2, it says, David stated, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. It's like, David, are you serious? And even God, speaking of David in 1 Kings 11, 4, said this, he goes, and God stated that the heart of David was perfect. David's heart was perfect in God's sight. And you know the life of David and the things that David has done. And Asa, the king at the time, Asa's heart was perfect in 1 Kings 15, 14. It was perfect all the days of his life. Matter of fact, when Asa received the illness and he was going to die, he actually brought that up to God. He goes, God, you know I've been perfect in your sight. I've done everything you told me to do. And God looked at him and said, okay, I'll give you 15 more years of your life. Pretty interesting story in 1 Kings 15. So to be perfect, therefore, even as your heavenly father is perfect. Perfect means complete, whole, finished, unblemished, undefiled. So how can we be perfect? How is it possible for you and I to be perfect? It's not possible. That's what Jesus is trying to tell the people. But if we look at it, the person who was talking to him at the very time, Jesus is complete. Jesus is whole. Jesus is finished. He's unblemished. He's undefiled. Therefore, Jesus is perfect. And so the answer is that we need Jesus. And so the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Jews, the Gentiles, the only way that you and I can obey this command to be perfect is we need to have Jesus Christ into our life. The very first command that we did, Jesus said, uh, the king, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. And this is what Paul says in Romans 10. He says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And for with one heart you believe, and this is counted unto you as righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between a Jew and a Greek. For the Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And Paul says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, he goes, God made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that we may become the righteousness of God. And even you know, that when we talk about the armor of God, we talk about the breastplate of righteousness. And see, Satan will constantly remind you that you're not good, you're not perfect, you're not righteous. But in reality, that's a lie. Because if you are in Christ, and Christ is in you, you are perfect. You are righteous. You are perfect in God's eyes. And it's hard for us to understand that. But when we receive Christ in our life, he forgives us for all our sin, past, present and future. And as a result of being 
forgiven for past, present, and future. Uh, oddly, people will say, uh, am I free to sin now? When I tried to help people understand, it's like, you are free. God has freed you. It's like you're let out of jail. You're free. You can do anything you want to do. And does that mean I can do anything? It's like, absolutely. It means anything. I can do anything. It's like, I, I can sin? This is what Paul would say in Romans 6 as a result of that. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that God's grace may increase? Because if you do sin, God will forgive you when you ask them. It will increase. And Paul says, by no means. We died to sin. How could we live any longer in it? He says, I want you to count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you're not under the law anymore. You're under grace. And Paul tells in Colossians, then he says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And set your mind on the things that are above, not on the earthly things. And put to death in you, therefore, the things that belong to this earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. And you must rid yourself of such things as these. Rid yourself of anger and malice, slander, and filthy languages from your lips. And do not lie to each other. He says, as God's chosen people, which we are, we're holy and we're dearly loved by God. I want you to clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. And bear with each other, put up with one another, and forgive whatever grievances that you have with one another. Forgive even as the Lord has forgiven you. And above all, put on love which binds all things together. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's why we have these verses. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to your Father in heaven. And Paul sums it up best in Romans 12 where he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of all that God has done for you, that we need to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. This is the reasonable thing to do. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to test and approve what God's will is for your life, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher in our faith. So the way that we really obey this command is we receive Christ. And if you and I are in Christ right now, the amazing thing for us to understand is that we are perfect in God's sight. When God looks at us, he sees perfection. So Jesus says, be perfect. Be living out who you are. Therefore, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much that you command us to be perfect, but we can't be perfect. But when Christ lives inside of us, we become perfect. And so, Lord, all that we can't do, you've done for us. There was nothing that we could do to earn our salvation. There's nothing that we can do to pay you back. So, Lord, help us to rejoice in that which you have given us. Forgiveness for all sin, past, present, and future. And even though we are free to do as we choose, help us to do as your word tells us and, and flee the things of this world. And to be perfect, to be living out who we are. To love our enemies and to love you as you want us to. So, Lord, again, help us to obey this command this week to be perfect by just rejoicing in what you have given us and not trying to earn our salvation, but to be thankful in all things. And I thank you for everyone here tonight. And I pray that we would commit ourselves to memorizing these verses. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.